Okay, so this is your um, second dose of the tractor connection. So the, uh, the first dose was administered by um, Andy about uh, 10 days ago, something like that. And um, by the end of this lecture, you'll be uh, fully immunized, fully vaccinated against uh, conformal geometry and especially the tractor connection. But let, let me remind you that a week from today, um, there is a, a booster shot available, and that is being delivered by uh, Rod Gover. Okay, so title probably, I don't know, I can't remember the title, but it's the same subject all over again. But of course, <clears throat> all of these viewpoints are different viewpoints on the same object. And so, um, you know, you learn something, I hope, by looking at it from different directions. Um, let me first just um, draw some pictures about what was happening last time. Okay, so in principle, this lecture is sort of independent of what was happening last, last time, but uh, nevertheless, here we go. So let's see, first, first I'm going to recall what I was talking about last time. What I was talking about last time was the ambient metric connection, uh, construction, which is the subject of uh, this book by Charlie Fetterman and Robin Gray. Okay, and they start with a conformal manifold. Of course, we're trying to do conformal differential geometry, so everybody's going to start with a conformal manifold. And here's a picture. You can tell it's somewhat bendy. It's not a sphere. And in order to um, record the fact that uh, the metric is not defined up to scale, you uh, put a bundle of scales above this manifold. So here is the bundle of scales. So when you've done that, a section of this bundle is precisely a representative metric in the conformal class. And as you change your, change your section, you'll change uh, freely the conformal factor. So this accurately records a conformal manifold um, and there's a parameter running up and down this, uh, these generators called T. Okay, and now the plan is to make this look like um, the standard light cone as far as possible in Minkowski space. So what you do is you thicken it out. So here's uh, a representation of it being thickened out. Some extra axes have appeared to give it some sort of illusion of three dimensionality. This of course is happening in much higher dimensions. But anyway, the, um, the other parameter that has been introduced here is called rho. Okay, and then you write down a metric uh, depending on uh, x, which is your variable on your original manifold, uh, t, which is the scaling parameter, and the new variable rho. And it looks like this. And if g is a constant, g, the metric g is just constant, um, then this is just, um, this is just, hyper, um, just Minkowski space. So the issue is, if you start with something which is not Minkowski space, then what, what can you do? Now, um, Boris uh, Krudikov asked me a, a question by email, um, which is that um, suppose you have an arbitrary uh, metric, which looks a little bit like this. Now I should admit that the first thing you do on this metric is you impose that it be Ricci flat. Suppose someone gives you a Ricci flat metric. Um, perhaps you can tell whether it arises in the way that I'm about to describe. And you can see already from this picture that um, there has to be um, an interact, there has to be a preferred vector field um, called, well, in this picture it'd be d by dt, which interacts with the metric nicely. So the lead derivative of the, uh, this uh, metric in dimension n plus two must, must be, uh, well, not, not the metric itself, but related to the metric, must scale appropriately. Um, and then you can try, um, well, factoring out by d by dt. Um, now, I mean, this question about, about Boris, when can you tell if you've got such a thing, is um, uh, tricky because, first of all, in even dimensions, there's something wrong with this um, 
prescription in even dimensions. The problem is you cannot find in generally, generally you cannot find even a power series expansion, just a formal solution for uh, G. Now you can do it to first order, and that's the next thing to observe. In first, to first order, you, you are forced to take G to be the original metric. On the right-hand side, that's the original metric in N dimensions, plus a very particular uh, tensor uh, times rho, and then you try and continue that to rho squared and so on. And this particular tensor is called the Shouten tensor, which occurs all the time in conformal differential geometry. Okay, but in even dimensions, there's some problem. And I should have said, and I probably didn't last time, that um, in even dimensions, it's worse than you might think, in that, sure enough, like for example, in three dimensions, there's an obstruction to doing this. It's the bar tensor in four dimensions. And um, you, might, you might hope that if the Bach tensor vanished, all your, uh, you know, your worries would be over. But no, it's not like that, unfortunately. Um, it's not only that you cannot do this expansion to infinite order, but uh, there's some ambiguity in this expansion as well. So you don't have a well-defined question. Um, the main thing, however, I mean, in odd dimensions, you could, you could ask the question, but the main issue is really <clears throat> that you're um, trying to pres prescribe this Ricci flat metric by some initial conditions along the light cone. And if you, you know, along what looks like the light cone, which, what, which is really the bundle of scales. And if you've, um, if you've thrown that information away, you've lost your initial uh, conditions. So, you know, this is like um, an initial value problem, except the initial surface is characteristic for the equations that you're trying to solve. But if you throw away where the initial surface is, then, well, you know, then, then it's a, a different issue. Now, you could factor out by T, and Rod will probably do that like next time. So he will be talking about the Poincaré metric, which is what you get on the whole thing divided by D by DT. But even so, uh, if you throw away where the boundary is of the Poincaré you know, metric that you're trying to, uh, yeah, that you're trying to construct, trying to, to characterize, then, um, well, anyway, <laughs> you can see that this is a, a, bit more, a bit more of an issue than you might think. So I'll just stop trying to answer Boris's question there. Okay, now, uh, the main thing about this construction, it is, if with suitable care, it is in fact uh, conformally invariant. And certainly to first order, which is all we're going to talk about in this talk, this is a, an invariant um, construction. Let me say a little bit more about this uh, Shouten tensor. Um, <clears throat> now you might think it's, uh, I've, I've labeled it by P, A, B, but no, that is actually an uppercase Greek row. And this terminology, um, the, row, the row tensor, has been carried on into other uh, parabolic geometries. So it so happens that in Riemannian geometry and conformal geometry, there's already a name for this, uh, named after Shouten. But uh, in more generally, um, it's a good idea near to have a name for the thing which occurs in all sorts of other geometries. And it's called the row tensor. And it is called the row tensor, sometimes with and sometimes without a hyphen, um, but it's called the row tensor um, in a book, which I should recommend to you, which probably Andy didn't mention last time, by um, Andy Chap and Jan Slovak called Parabolic Geometries One Background Material, where you'll find not only background material, but actually heaps of lovely examples of parabolic geometry in addition to conformal geometry. So anyway, if you're going to pursue this in realms other than conformal geometry, this is called the row tensor. And usually in Riemannian geometry, it's given by some seemingly um, arcane formula. However, here is a much better way of seeing how the row tensor fits in general, in general dimensions. In fact, what you do is you write out the, uh, the Riemann curvature tensor, that's the thing on the left, in terms of a trace-free part, which is called the vial tensor, that's W. And then the row tensor is precisely the symmetric tensor which you, uh, which you need in order to fill in the rest of this tensor. 
right? So this is another way of decomposing the uh, Riemann curvature tensor rather than just taking the trace and calling that the Ricci tensor. You do this maneuver, you'll get something called the Shouten tensor. Looks more natural from this point of view. Um, I should also point out that um, much of what I was talking about last time, um, I had to remind myself of what was going on, both by reading the ambient metric book, but also reading my own review of it, um, which is in the uh, Bulletin of the American Mathematical Society. So some of the calculations which I did last time um, are actually done in the uh, book review. So uh, that's something, uh, something of a, uh, notes on last, on the last lecture, sort of that, that review. Okay, now let us just look at the ambient metric only to first order and see what happens. And when you do this, uh, you'll find that um, you get a, well, a relation between the ambient metric construction and standard tractors. And this is explained in great detail in this article by um, Andreas Chap and Ralph Gover. So, um, what you do is, well, first of all, you just notice that the tangent bundle to the ambient metric um, has um, rank too bigger than the original, um, the original manifold. You've added a bundle of scales and you've thickened it, each of those steps adding one dimension. The tangent bundle is also filtered. So for example, it has a rank one sub bundle, right? That's the, the bundle of, uh, that's, that's um, pointing in the T direction. That's the bundle that's up the, up the cone. The generators of the cone give you a rank one sub bundle. And also if you factor out by both that sub bundle and the uh, pullback of the um, tangent bundle to the manifold itself, it has a rank one uh, quotient bundle as well. Now, I've taken the liberty of writing, since I'm giving this talk in Vienna, I've taken the liberty of writing quotient bundle as uh, all one word in good German tradition. And the other thing that you find, however, is that the um, ambient Levitrovita connection, right, which is, well, at least a first order anyway, uh, this is the, the thing that you've created by the ambient metric construction, actually descends to M. In other words, it means that, well, first of all, you can pull it back, you know, you can pull back any connection to a, to a sub-manifold, so you pull it back to this cone, and then you see how it interacts with d by dt, and you find that it, it does interact with d by dt in a very nice way, which means that, in fact, you can get it by pulling back something on M. And the thing on M, you write out a formula for it, and here it is. Okay, so that formula is actually in that uh, ambient book, uh, the ambient metric uh, book review. And if you, if you were paying attention during uh, uh, Andy's talk, or even if you, you're not, I can tell you that this formula was the formula that, um, that he uh, derived for the um, tractor connection. Okay, so somehow this formula has appeared. Um, can you remind? Magic. Can you remind us what these symbols are? Sigma, <laughs> u, rho. Okay, so, so they will right, they, they will come they will come up again soon. At the moment, they're just um, so this uh, tangent bundle. This tangent bundle of the ambient metric has rank n plus two. Okay, so this uh, sigma, mu, and rho are coordinates on this, um, this, these are five coordinates on this, uh, this rank n plus two bundle. Okay, so roughly speaking, sigma lies in this, uh, records this uh, uh, quotient bundle, this rank one quotient bundle. The rank one sub bundle is recorded by, unfortunately by rho, which I've just noticed. <laughs> Oh no, this is terrible, isn't it? So rho is actually the standard, it's standard I'm using the standard usage here of, of the bottom, <laughs> bottom component of this thing. It's not, the, nothing has nothing to do with the rho, which was a coordinate on the previous slide. Okay, but anyway, so the thing at the bottom there is the uh, like, that's in the d by dt direction. Uh, mu is roughly speaking a one form on your manifold um, and sigma is the quotient. This is going to become, I mean, we're not, we're going to avoid this in a minute. Okay, so this, the, you, you can take this with a grain of salt, okay? I claim that what we've got is formula for the standard tractors, but now we're going to throw all this away and start again. Okay, you'll be relieved to hear. Okay, so that's the, 
the next the next slide right there must be another way yeah this is a, a this is a very natural way of proceeding but it, it's it's not as natural as natural can be so here's another way of of deriving this bundle and its connection okay and it goes back actually to 1924 by an article by Brinkman. Brinkman wrote two articles, one in 24, one in, well, no, two articles in 24. This one was submitted in 22, and he got his thesis in 25, and then he stopped. I mean, his, his PhD thesis is in 1925 from Harvard, and then, and then he just, uh, oh, he wrote a book on uh, linear algebra later. So, but, but, and, and, and <laughs> I, was, I was previously a bit disappointed in this, in this uh, paper for reasons I will explain. But having read it again, in order to tell you about you know, how disappointed I was, I found that I'm not disappointed at all. This is a just absolutely amazing article. So, <clears throat> and here's is, here is, um, another article. This is by Claude Lebrun. And you'll notice both of these are uh, considering the Einstein's equation. So both of them are answer, asking the following question. Uh, so here is what is manifestly a conformally invariant question, question, at least. Suppose I give you a metric, and it could be any signature, but let's take it to be Riemannian. So is there an Einstein metric in the conformal class? In other words, can I rescale this metric by you know, a, a smooth, smoothly varying scale, positive scale, so that the uh, resulting metric is actually Einstein, meaning its um, uh, Ricci tensor is, uh, its trace-free Ricci tensor is zero. So its Ricci tensor is proportional to the metric. So this is the simple question, which both these people uh, considered in these two articles. Uh, Brinkman did the following. He rescaled re re G by a rescaling of this form, e to the 2f. Okay, now this is a very, a very good maneuver because first of all, the two there means that e to the f has units of length. So something is happening here to do, incorporating the fact that uh, the, the uh, metric gives you uh, the square of length rather than the length itself. So he does this and then he simply works out what the um, trace free reach tensor uh, looks like in terms of the new metric. This is the new metric. And <clears throat> yeah, does it vanish? And he derives the following system of equations. Okay, so here are some equations on f. The first equation simply says that the derivative of f is lambda. Okay, so little lowercase lambda. I'm using his notation here. So he's got both lo lowercase lambda and capital lambda in, in his notation. But I'm just following him exactly. All right, so, um, so uh, the first equation just gives a name to the derivative of f, it's called lambda, and then the others are equations on lambda itself. And you notice the Shouten tensor is arising here, as you would perhaps expect, since this is a conformal question. And he gets, anyway, he gets the system of equations. Uh, Claude Lebrun, however, <coughs> uh, adopts a relatively peculiar, um, you know, what at first sight seems rather peculiar way of proceeding, namely he rescales the, uh, the metric by a positive function to the power minus two. And the really amazing thing is that if you do that, then the uh, Einstein equations become a linear, system, a linear constraint on sigma, okay? And, and I've written that below. And then there's a standard maneuver whereby you can take any linear system of equations like this, and you can, uh, for example, you introduce a name for the derivative of sigma, and uh, let's call it mu, and you get a system of equations. Okay, so now we, let's just look at these two, two approaches to this problem and see what's happened. So the really good thing about, of course, the really good thing about um, uh, Claude Lebrun's maneuver is that it gives you a, um, a uh, I, I, yeah, it gives you a linear system. Right? This is a, a linear equation to start with, and you prolong it and you get a linear system. Okay, so this is linear in sigma, mu, and rho. Okay, whereas you know if you look at Brinkman's system, it's nonlinear. So first of 
all it's got the square of lambda in there, it's got capital lambda times little lambda, and it's got this, uh, this tensor rho, uh, not multiplied by anything, it's just sitting there all, all, all by itself. So this is a nonlinear system, whereas Lebrun's is a, a linear system. And at that point, you know, I've, I've always sort of, yeah, much to my shame, I just <laughs> stopped reading Brinkman's paper, but, I should tell you, it's, it's really, it's really very good. So the first thing is that, uh, so this is linear, so happy signs, nonlinear. I was previously unhappy, but now uh, <coughs> Brinkman simply throws away the first equation. This is very cool. If you throw away the first equation, because you know f f never appears again after that first equation, then <coughs> you can see from the equation two there, well, Brinkman's two point three two, the second of his, his equations that the derivative of lambda isn't necessarily symmetric, right? You throw all this other stuff onto the other side and you can deduce therefore immediately from the second equation that actually lambda is the derivative of something, okay? And the only thing that it's not clear what it's is, is uh, the only ambiguity in that is that F is not defined up to a, a positive uh, additive, uh, up, sorry, up to an additive constant. Of course, if you take F to be constant, then all that happens in Brinkman's rescaling is that you're rescaling the metric by a constant. And of course, if you've got something which is Einstein, you rescale it by a constant, it's still Einstein. So he's thrown away a very <coughs> good thing to throw away, namely you just don't see constant rescalings in the system at all. Anyway, so he then takes equation uh, 2.32 and 2.33, and he shows that his system here is completely integrable if and only if it's conformal, you, conform Euclidean, he calls it. Okay, which in our terminology nowadays means conformally flat. And he does this just by, well, you know, you've got this system. Oh, I should point out that both of these systems, these both these systems are closed. In other words, Brinkman's is a system for F, uh, lowercase lambda and uppercase lambda. Uh, Claude Lebrun's system, after you prolong it, is a system for sigma, mu, and rho. But the thing is that all of the derivatives of, well, sigma, mu, and rho are determined in terms of the gadgets themselves. And similarly for all of the derivatives of f, uh, lowercase lambda, and uppercase lambda. So these systems are, both of them are closed. So in principle, you can take these equations and you can differentiate them as many, many, many times as you like and try and get compatibility conditions. And Brinkman just shows that you know, in two lines, it's really straightforward that actually uh, the, uh, the system is completely integrable if and only if it's conform Euclidean. So he already knows uh, about Vial tensor and Cotton York tensor, but uh, these, these are the obstructions to being conform Euclidean in his terminology. But also for the rest of the paper, and it's only 10 pages long, he then differentiates it again and again and again. And he pretty much, you know, comes up with, well, yeah, he, he's, he says he's not gonna do it because it, it, it's a bit tedious and so on, but never mind. Um, what he does in principle is he observes that you can actually get, you know, pretty much necessary and, condi necessary and sufficient conditions for the integrability of his, uh, of his system. Right, so even though you know, vector bundles haven't been invented, connections haven't been invented, holonomy hasn't been invented, and uh, the Ambrose-Singer theorem has not been proved, that's pretty much what he's doing in the rest of the paper. Anyway, <clears throat> let's look at uh, consequence of this. Um, I said last, last time, so straight away you can deduce something from just Brinkman's observation, translated into these other terminology. Um, Last time I said that the uh, Lorentzian metric was uh, this ambient metric. This has got where you've got a, a particular um, second order term in a particular coefficient of rho squared is flat if G is conformally flat. And someone asked me a question, which I didn't answer properly at all. Like the question was, is this if and only if? And it is, right? So if and only if it's conformally flat. Right? And the reason is that, for example, you can just say, Okay, let's, um, <clears throat> let's just look at this um, Lorentzian ambient metric just to uh, first order in row. In other words, reverting to our, our 
convoluted construction of the uh, tractor connection, which we'll come back to. And you know that Brinkman has shown that it's um, that uh, it's uh, conformally Euclidean if the uh, Lorentzian metric is, is, is flat, even just to first order. So this is flat to second order, to all orders. So certainly to four. Now, <clears throat> somewhere I have a formula for this. It's in a filing cabinet in the room behind me. Um, I will write out and put in a space here, a formula for the curvature of, the, of this particular ambient metric in terms of the original curvature of the manifold. Okay, and then I, before, before these things get posted on the web. So you'll find a formula here, but I hope, haven't got it out of my filing cabinet yet. Right, now, okay. Right, I'm gonna give up on Brinkman and we'll come back to uh, Claude Lebrun's um, formula and the prolongation thereof. Now, in order to uh, make sense of this, I am going to just tell you a little bit more about something that you are really obliged to do in conformal differential geometry. You're obliged to deal with conformal densities, not just functions. Okay, so what is a conformal density? I'll just tell you that and then, uh, and then we'll get back to uh, Claude's um, uh, equation. <clears throat> and I'll tell you what it is operationally, right? So you can, you can set it up as you know, some principal bundle, blah, 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 but operationally it's this. So you think of conformal geometry as um, Riemannian geometry, except you're, um, you've only got your metric defined up to scale, but you can always choose a scale. If you choose a scale, what's a conformal density? Well, confusingly, it's a function on the nose, right? A conformal, if you've got a metric in your conformal class, a conformal density is nothing more than a function. Now, the only tricky thing, however, is if you rescale the metric, and here is my preferred rescaling of the metric, then the uh, function is obliged also, this what you, what you thought was a function, but is actually a conformal density, is obliged to rescale. It rescales by a factor of omega. You can see that this is consistent if you do it twice, you know, this is a homomorphism, right? So this, this number omega <coughs> is called the conformal weight, and it can be any real number. All right. So for, here's an example, an N form on an oriented Riemannian manifold and it's called so omega. Of course, the concept of an N form is of course a completely invariant concept, has nothing to do with even being a Riemannian uh, N manifold. Right. However, if you have an, a Riemannian metric, then <coughs> associated with that Riemannian metric, at least on an oriented Riemannian manifold, is a volume form completely picked out, completely characterized by the Riemannian metric. You have called it DV. And then you ask what happens if you change the metric? Well, this volume form changes. And therefore, if the omega is supposed to be a um, well-defined N form, then uh, this uh, coefficient will have to change as well. So the volume scales up by omega to the power N, and F is obliged to scale down by omega to the power N. In other words, it's a conformal density of weight minus N. Okay, so here's some notation, <coughs> which we're going to have to use. <coughs> this is the bundle of conformal densities of weight W. Okay, so in the presence of a metric, they're functions. Otherwise, you know how they scale. <coughs> you can, you can uh, take uh, tensors, for example, K forms, um, and you can weight those as well. You just tensor the bundles together. And um, all of the tensor bundles uh, can have weights attached to them in this way. And that's actually in some precise sense, that's a complete list of the irreducible uh, bundles uh, that you have on a conformal manifold, but you're obliged to have this weight. You're obliged to keep track of it. And then, you know, things like, you know, a one form, if it has weight two, that's the same as the tangent bundle. Because if you've got something in the tangent bundle, invariantly defined, you use a metric to lower its index in the standard way. In the Riemannian setting, that would just identify the tangent bundle with the cotangent bundle. But here, the corresponding thing with a, a lowered index would have a weight, simply because the metric that you're using to lower the index um, scales. 
Okay, now having done that, there are some uh, differential operators that you can write down which interact well with these various bundles. So for example, exterior derivatives, they, they're certainly invariant. They don't have anything to do with a metric or anything. And even you know, mapping from n minus one forms to n forms. But here, you know, you can take your n minus one form and you can um, hodge dual it to get something which has a lower, just one lowered index, and that, but it has an appropriate weight because you've used the, uh, you've used the, um, uh, the volume form to, to lower the index, so it has this weight. And then what look, used to look like um, exterior derivative now looks like divergence, but this is an invariant operation, right? That's sort of just rephrasing things in a sort of slightly awkward way, but here's a non-awkward one here. Whoops, huh, that's strange. Oh, yeah, this is supposed to come up one at a time. Here's the conformal Laplacian. Okay, this is a precise, they're a precise uh, formulation of what, um, of what I said was an invariant operator uh, last time. Okay, so the thing in the middle there, the, uh, the expression involving the uh, Laplacian and the scalar curvature, that is computed with respect to a particular choice of metric in your conformal class. And if you rescale the metric, then various things rescale, and you're also obliged to rescale f. That's what it means to say that f is in fact a conformal density. It rescales with a particular weight, one minus n over two. And then you end up something in, in a different bundle, something that scales slightly differently. But it's a really good exercise to check that this is invariant. And here is the corresponding thing um, for this conformal to Einstein operator, whereby you are obliged to start with something of weight one in order to make this invariant. You can see that that's correct because what Claude does is he multiplies the metric, which has weight, tautologically has weight two, with a uh, sigma to the power minus two. So you want the weights to cancel out in order to give you a well-defined metric. But anyway, this is a, a conformally invariant linear differential operator between two of these bundles now. So you always write it down in terms of a metric in the conformal class, but it turns out to be ind independent. And there's, there's heaps of these things. I mean, not obvious, it's not obvious that there are heaps of them, but there are. Okay, you can ask okay. about a class. Uh, okay. me. Okay. We'll come to this. Yeah. What is this small zero? Ah, zero means take zero trace, 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 free, trace free path. Trace free path. Oh, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. I should have mentioned that. Trace free path. Okay. Now let's try and get the trip to connection out of this. Okay, so here are the uh, the references. So a couple of years, this is a couple of years after Brinkman is Tracy Thomas. Uh, Carter is in 1923, and this is very similar. That's, I mean, all of these things are. All of these things with the, the modern perspective are actually um, equivalent. Um, here is uh, in four dimensions, uh, this construction was uh, rediscovered by uh, Roger Penrose. Okay, except, except that instead of, yeah, I should, I, I should say why these things are called tractors. So, so, so uh, this, um, bundle that, that's written down in four dimensions by Penrose in 72 is called uh, the local twister bundle. And uh, it's based on a, an overdetermined system of differential equations called the, the twister equation. And, uh, <clears throat> but you need spinners and you need, you need to do, you really need to do this in dimension four to, 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 to have it be really, really helpful. Um, <clears throat> but, um, so this uh, construction of uh, Tracy Yerkes Thomas in 1926 is doing it in all dimensions, but using vectors rather than, rather than spinners. Okay, so tractor is another word ending in OR, like uh, vector, tensor, twister, and so on. And um, also has some um, relevant um, you know, Latin meaning. Okay, and then here is an article by uh, uh, myself, Terry Bailey and Rob Dover, which is explaining uh, Thomas's construction from a modern viewpoint. 
Okay. So right away, I can tell you what the tractor bundle is. This was actually a question in Andy's talk. Is this tractor bundle a sub bundle of a jet bundle or something like that? And it is. If you look at this differential equation, uh, this differential operator, trace free part of this uh, second order gadget here, um, you'll find that um, although this is overdetermined and doesn't generally speaking have um, any solutions at all, um, if you were trying to find solutions, you could ask what you, what you could prescribe at a point in order to try and get a solution. And of course you could, could try and prescribe the value of sigma and you could try and prescribe the value of its derivative. And then, well, you can't prescribe the value of, of the, an arbitrary value to its second derivative because it's constrained by this equation, but you can prescribe its trace. Okay, so what this equation defines you, defines for you in an invariant way is actually a subbundle of the second jets. Okay, so I'll just throw that out that you can define the bundle there. And of course, in the presence of a metric, if you have a subbundle of a jet bundle like that, then not only uh, is, your, uh, is your line bundle uh, trivialized, that's uh, what happens for any conformal densities, but also you have a leverage of eta connection, which allows you to split up the jet bundle into its, uh, into its, its parts. The, um, so its parts being the, um, the, very, uh, the, the derivatives, right? So it's no longer, um, this jet bundle is, is filtered, but this is no longer filtered. It now becomes a direct sum. There you go. And now here is this um, uh, tractor connection. Okay, now <clears throat> I'll just say, say what you can do in order to get this tractor connection. So one thing you can do is look at um, this equation, this Claude's equation here, and <clears throat> you can uh, prolong it. Now the process of prolongation is precisely, you look at your, I mean, it's not a well-defined, it's somewhat of an art form, but um, you look at your differential equation and you give names to the things that you don't know, uh, such as, for example, the differential equation, you know, you've got a name for the, you've got a name for sigma, you don't have a name for its derivative. So you call its derivative mu. The second, the second line here is just re-expressing what the uh, equation actually says. The equation says that the derivative of mu, in other words, the second derivative of sigma, if you add rho times sigma to it, you get something which is pure trace. And now all I've done is given a name to the trace part and I've called that, that trace part um, uh, rho, okay? And then it so happens and you know, this happens for certain equations and not for others. These are so-called finitely determined equations where this happens, that you can try and figure out from the second line, you can try and figure out what the derivative of rho has to be. And you find that the system immediately closes up. You can indeed. So you, in other words, what you do, you take the second equation, second line of this equation, you differentiate one more time and skew in order to bring in curvature. And you find that what happens is that the derivative of, of, of rho is determined. And this is what the formula you get. So this is determined by a perfectly sort of straightforward, um, just, you know, um, a bit of an art form, but never mind. It's, it's, it's called, it has a name, it's called prolongation. However, what you can do is just take this formula and just check that it's invariantly defined, right? This is an invariantly defined filtered bundle with an invariant connection, right? So you can just bite the bullet and figure out what happens if you change your metric, right? So when you change your metric, everything changes. The filtration of this bundle T changes, but you know how it changes because you've been decomposing it with respect to the leverage of eta connection. So you know how, how bits of sigma feed into, into mu and bits of mu feed into rho and so on and so forth. And you know how the rho tensor, the shout tensor changes, you know how the leverage of eta connection changes, and you just check, it's a page, it's a page of you know, heavy checking here, that <clears throat> this is actually an invariant expression. So you, you, the, the great thing is you only have to do this once because many other things which are invariant are deduced from this connection. Okay, and here are its basic properties. First of all, it's been obtained by prolongation. And because of that, 
you actually get a, an isomorphism between the um, um, Einstein scales, that's what these things are, the, sig the sigmas of an appropriate density satisfying this equation. These are the things which actually, which actually, you know, in a neighborhood of where, wherever it is you're, you're uh, yeah, in the place where sigma is defined, this and and, and of course sigma has to be uh, non-zero, so you can take um, sigma to the power of minus two times g. When you do that, you get um, a solution of Einstein's equations. So you know this 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 first thing, first thing that we have on the top line here is something that we really wanted to know about. Um, Rod will no doubt tell you what happens um, when uh, sigma is uh, has zeros, okay? But when sigma is, doesn't have zeros, okay, it has a good geometric interpretation, but whether or not it has zeros, it's actually this, this linear space here is, is just identified with the covariant constant sections of our bundle T. Uh, so in particular, you can say what the dimension of this space is, right? It's less than or equal to N minus N plus two. Okay, and there's even a formula for how it works. If you just look at the formula for the local tractors, you know, for, the, for the tractor connection, you'll find that sigma has to go to sigma. You know, mu is obliged to be the derivative and rho is obliged to be this. And actually this operator going uh, from sigma to uh, this uh, tractor is invariantly defined whether or not this uh, differential equation has any solutions. It's a bit of a weird thing. You're starting with a differential equation which may not have any solutions, and you're making these conformally variant uh, conclusions from it. Uh, the next thing you do with any um, connection is compute its curvature. So this is uh, uh, what uh, you know, Brinkman was doing, but this is a linear computation. And this is what you get. Okay, so on the left-hand side, I've applied two derivatives to this, uh, this uh, rank n bundle and skewed them. And on the right hand side, you get this. So uh, W here is the vial tensor, as previously described. Um, and here you're encountering a, a, a derivative of the Shannon tensor. Yeah. Could, could, could you clarify? So, Nabla in this uh, formula Einstein equation is Levitch Vita covariant derivative, right? While Nabla Correct. in the last yes. formula is from the Dracker connection. That's right, it is. So, I, yes, I, yes. I, 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 Yes, I should have pointed out that I use Nabla for all connections, <laughs> whether they're the leverage of each connection. I mean, some people don't, but you know, uh, I just use Nabla for um, just any connection. So it's both, for example, the connection on the, uh, the tractor bundle, uh, looking at covariant constant sections. And it's also the, um, the thing that I'm now taking the, uh, uh, applying twice and taking the skew. And of course I should, you know, yeah, there's a number of things being swept under the carpet here. So in order for the left-hand side to make sense, when I write this curvature down, I'm picking an arbitrary, well, I could pick an arbitrary torsion free connection, but I could pick the metric connection and just uh, couple that with the, with the uh, tractor connection in order to make sense of applying the connection twice. Okay, so I have to do that. So it doesn't, you know, <clears throat> but 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 as as you, I'm sure you all know, this is an invariant thing to do. It doesn't really see the uh, the choice of torsion free connection, right? And now you can read off conformal flatness from this equation. If n is greater than or equal to four, you see that the um, the uh, middle part of this curvature in the middle here ha has has to vanish. And if n is uh, three. Uh, if n is three, then the vial tensor is identically zero by algebraic considerations anyway. And you get this other condition in terms of the derivative of the Schouten tensor. This is always a little bit of a mystery when you first come across this in conformal geometry, unless you've come across it by a natural route like this. Um, the point is that the, uh, <coughs> if, the, uh, if n is um, greater than or equal to four, you can deduce that this other tensor vanishes by a contraction of the Bianchi identity. And I've written out precisely that contraction there. You'll see there's an N minus three here. So when N is equal to three, this equation disappears and you're, uh, you're instead um, looking at just this derivative of the Schouten tensor, which is called the cotton york tensor by some people. Okay, so uh, now you can roll this backwards. I mean, 
So you can actually use the uh, flatness of this connection to show that um, your um, original manifold is locally uh, conformally isomorphic to uh, Euclidean space. This is something, something which, uh, which Andy mentioned last time. As soon as you've got one of these connections, the Cartan connection is flat, you can make immediate deduction. Uh, the other thing that's coming out of this is that the location of curvature is in two different places. So depending on when n is uh, greater than equal to four, when it's three, there's sort of a leading part here, which is called the harmonic curvature. And this is a general story. And the really good thing is that in the, in the general story in parabolic geometry, the location of these things is automatic. And you, you can see where it is by doing some uh, Lie algebra cohomology uh, calculations. All right, now let's look at, uh, <clears throat> I promised you that this has something to do with the classification of conformally invariant operators. So let's, let's try that. Um, I'm just gonna do it in four dimensions. If you look at the Durham complex in four dimensions, of course, that's as invariant as invariant can be. And here it is. But in four dimensions, the two forms split. So in the Riemannian signature, they just split as real bundles. In the neutral signature, they split as real bundles. In the eigenspaces of the, um, of the Hodge star operator, which is invariant on two forms. And in, um, in, in Lorentzian uh, signature, uh, you have to look at these bundles being complex, look at the, uh, because the eigenvalues are then either pl plus or minus i. But let's not get into that. Regard these as complex bundles, they certainly split like that canonically. Okay, so <clears throat> here are some invariant operators. The, the, um, the ones going in and out of uh, the self-dual and anti-self-dual two forms, as they're called, these things here are uh, using the conformal structure. Okay. Now let's try and just guess what's going on here. Here's a roadmap of what's going on, right? Okay, so you can uh, so the uh, <clears throat> you can think of this as uh, uh, roads between various uh, countries or uh, uh, states, perhaps. So there'd be Idaho on the left, Texas on the right, and various other states in between. Right, so you know what the other states are because there's four of them meeting at a point. But the thing is, you can, you can think of this, you can draw a circle around it and you can think of this as something happening on the sphere. So this is actually a, um, a loon on a sphere. I'll just tell you what a loon is. So a, a loon, well, here's, you know, I've got a sphere. There we go, right, so you can probably see this because it's quite big. So this, this loon here, a loon, is like um, a slice of a slice of lemon out of out of the sphere. Okay, the um, <clears throat> particular loon that we're talking about here is precisely one quarter of the sphere. Okay, now you used to be able to buy plastic plaster models of, of spheres. You could you could order them from a factory in Germany, which uh, this is. Uh, I don't know, around the end of the 19th century where you could, you could buy these things. And this is, this is one of the things you, could, you can buy. So there's a, there's a little uh, website listed at the bottom of this slide if you want to go and look at some others. Um, and here is the, uh, right, and here is uh, this roadmap uh, draw, drawn as uh, arrows on this loon on this sphere. And you might think that actually these countries, these different 20, well, you have 24 countries on your, on your sphere, right? Because you've got six countries here in this quarter of a sphere, and four times six is 24. So that maybe these countries are actually uh, vial chambers. So um, now I wouldn't be telling you this, of course, in case, it, unless it were actually true. <laughs> so you can, you can think of these countries as as, as, as um, vial chambers for um, the, the group A3. Right, so here, for example, is a, <coughs> here is a, 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 a uh, there we go. Here is a, a uh, vial chambers of the group A3 
uh, drawn um, by myself on a, a ping pong ball. Um, here, here are some drawn by Dennis Tay. We, this is this is for the uh, the VAR group of uh, uh, C three or equivalently B three. Um, you can you can learn a lot by drawing these things. Right, <clears throat> more invariant operators. Now the thing is that that pattern of invariant operators uh, repeats itself. For example, <clears throat> you can start with the tangent bundle instead of the trivial bundle, and you can ask. You know, well, maybe maybe there's a, a, a pattern of invariant operator which, which looks exactly like the Durham complex, and there is. So first of all, what are the bundles? Okay, well, there's some arcane notation here, which I'm not going to explain. It's based on Dinkin diagrams. But the way that you get all of these on other bundles is by letting the vial group act on this first bundle. Okay, this is the so-called affine action of the vial group. Um, and now let me tell you that this, this uh, speculation about uh, invariant operators and so on is actually true in conformal geometry, starting with the tangent bundle. Okay, and what you get is so-called uh, conformal deformation sequence. So this is evidence. This is a, this is a bona fide thing. Right, so here is the um, uh, tangent bundle. Here are these other bundles. And what are you to make of these things? Okay, so this is vector fields. This first operator is, uh, and, and then these other things have uh, interpretations. This is like conformal perturbations of your metric. This is like self-dual and anti-self-dual curvature. And these are some other spaces. But the point is that these operators, like this first operator here, has a well-known geometric interpretation. It's the conformal killing operator. So this is something which is invariant on vector fields. Okay, and this, uh, these various other operators are second order, like these two, for example, are second order. And of course, as you probably realize, the, if you take a conformal perturbation of a metric and work out what's happened to its curvature, that's necessarily second order as well. And you get all sorts of other things coming out of the sequence. So for example, these second order operators, um, either starting with self dual vial curvature or anti self dual vial curvature, you, these are invariant operators, and each of them give you the Bach tensor. And that's some sort of Bianchi identity showing you get the same, same thing, no matter which way you go. Anyway, you now ask about a classification. All right, so here are some articles. This is one by myself and uh, John Rice. Um, and the important thing about this article is that it's wrong. I mean, well, one of the, I mean, mostly it's right. <laughs> okay, mostly it's right, but there's a, there's a very, very, silly error in it, which was, uh, which I just could not spot for, well, what's that, five years. But um, <clears throat> Robin Gay at Graham pointed out that one of the operators that we, we said should exist in 1987 uh, did not actually exist. So this is his article, Conformally Invariant Powers of the Laplacian Non-Existence. This is in four dimensions. Um, uh, he's looking at the cube of the Laplacian and he adds all possible curvature correction terms to the cube of the Laplacians. This is a, a, a big task. And checks that when it's acting on, uh, this is acting on densities of weight one, that there's no possible combination that you can put there, which makes it invariant. Okay, so there's some algebra which goes into the first article. And the algebra is then taken up by myself and Jan Slovak a few years later which somewhat gives you um, uh, an explanation of why these conformally invariant powers uh, don't exist. But it's an algebraic exposition. Okay, well, anyway. Now, you have to be beware of what conformally invariant actually means, right? So I've not told you what conformally invariant means. Probably most people you know, know, but you have to be, you know, have an idea of what it means, but you have to be um, beware, you have to beware. Now, one thing where you can make sense of what conformally invariant operator actually means before you even start is on a homogeneous space. Okay, so suppose you have a homogeneous space like that, then irreducible representations of P give rise to irreducible vector bundles. So whether they're irreducible or not, representations of P give you homogeneous bundles on G mod P. They're bundles for which the action of G um, just lifts to the, uh, the total space of the bundle 
acting linearly on the fibers. So you don't really need to know about P in order to know about what a homogeneous vector bundle means if you know what G is. But anyway, there's this well-known one-to-one -one correspondence between these things. And what you're really looking for, if you're looking for invariant uh, differential operators is invariant at homomorphisms of, of, uh, of G bundles, of homogeneous vector bundles between, so if you're looking for a K, K order operator, you're looking for um, uh, an invariant op a homomorphism between the K jet bundle of V and F. Okay, so uh, you can turn this into algebra. You'd expect that because it's a homogeneous space and so on and so forth. And there's a key point here, which is uh, actually, well, there are two, two ingredients here. And one of them is due to uh, Greg Zuckerman. Okay, and these are algebraic ingredients. And the other one is due to Harris Chandra, but we'll just come to that in a moment. Okay, now let me just, let me just you know, tell you roughly speaking how this, how this works. You're looking for G and equi equivariant homomorphisms uh, between these bundles. And there's a trick. The trick is, and this is something which occurred in Ian Anderson's talks, whereby if you're looking for um, a calculus that applies somehow to jets, it's a good idea to not restrict yourself to any particular jet, like the Kth jet or something. What you should do is just uh, go to um, arbitrarily high jets. So this is a, a sequence of uh, vector bundles. If you're in the homogeneous setting, these are all uh, G homogeneous bundles, and you can just take a, an infinite uh, inverse limit of this, and you get an infinite dimensional uh, vector bundle. Okay, which you know people generally, you know, differential geometrists tend to tend to balk at, right? So, but nevertheless, this is I claim a good thing to do because <clears throat> you can uh, turn this into algebra. So remember that um, a homogeneous vector bundle is constructed from a representation of P, and this is how it's constructed. So either you've seen this before or, or you haven't, in which case I'm not going to tell you about it, but there's, a, there's this, uh, you, you, you just take the product of G with E, in other words, the trivial uh, vector bundle, then you quotient it by the action of P, um, so as to get G mod P, and also to quotient by your bundle in order to get this homogeneous bundle. And this corresponds to doing an, an, a purely algebraic operation um, <clears throat> on uh, the other side. This is, this, is, um, this is like a dual and algebraic operation on, so you take the dual of the bundle and in order to accommodate this, uh, in order to accommodate this, uh, in, these infinite jets, uh, what you should look at in order to, uh, to build this into your description you want something which, uh, which is uh, nice and algebraic and filtered, and what could be better than the universal enveloping algebra of the, of the bundle G? So you take the universal enveloping algebra and you do something like this, uh, this induced um, operation. And this is called induction in the algebraic uh, setting. So you get this new uh, bundle, which uh, has a mistaken font here. I should call, probably call this V of, of uh, math bold face E. But anyway, you get this algebraic construction and it's a G module. And the thing is that, um, so the thing that, the, the, reason, the reason this is so good is that, that it's a G model is then you, you, you have various uh, representation theoretic tools at your disposal. Um, and this, uh, this um, homomorphisms between E and F correspond exactly to G module homomorphisms going the other way between the dual bundle. Okay, and then uh, Harris Chandra's theorem gives you this, uh, this um, uh, pattern of um, bundles that you get here. Harris Chandra's theorem tells you about the, uh, when, you, when you can have two of these, uh, a when you could possibly have a homomorph homomorphism between two uh, G model, modules of this time. It, it gives you a, a, a necessary condition. They have to be in the same orbit of the, of the Weyl group. And, uh, and then when you do that, you recover this, this roadmap. Actually, you recover something else and you recover this operator 
starting right at the beginning and go to, going to the end. So these are some unexpected surprises. These include powers of the Laplacian. And uh, you can, you can uh, translate between these different patterns using something called the Zuckerman translation functor. And the tractor, con tractor connection allows you to do this in the curved setting, providing you are sufficiently careful. And I can see that I'm running out of time. Well, I've run out of time, so I will stop. Okay, here we go, stopping now. So, thank you very much for the talk. Are there any questions? Okay, thanks, Andy. Okay. Yes, I actually have a question on the very last uh, thing you wrote, if you can just. Yes. So now there is a general answer to the problem of finding curves and analogs with these invariant operators and the flat. Okay, so we don't... So, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't. so even in four dimensions, we don't, we don't actually know. So, no. so there's, there's some feedback here. Uh, okay, so even in four... I'll just continue speaking even though I'm getting feedback. So, um, yeah, so even in four dimensions, uh, we don't, strictly speaking, know. So, um, all, of, all of the things on this little uh, original pattern here um, of these, uh, uh, like the little diamond in the middle of the two, like the Durham sequence, all of these things have curved analogs, no question about that. But the operator which goes from the beginning of this complex to the end, which includes, for example, the operator going from uh, functions to, um, to four forms, uh, which in four dimensions is uh, this uh, Panout's operator, its existence is, is a bit more subtle. And you can see when you look at it, if you check its, its um, conformal invariance, you, you really do have to use the fact that uh, derivatives commute on functions, right? So <laughs> this is a bit of a giveaway that the fact that it commutes on, commutes on functions has to be used just in verifying that it's conformally invariant. So you would suspect that for any other case, it's not the case, that, 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 that fails, right? So this is what uh, Robin Graham checked in uh, for the cube of the Laplacian in four dimensions. For higher powers of the Laplacian, there's a, a, um, an in, uh, yeah, a, a more subtle argument by uh, Rod Gover and Kengo Hirachi that proves that although in the flat case, the arbitrary powers of the Laplacian on appropriately weighted functions, these things fail to have curved analogs in general. But there are more besides, right? So um, the trouble is you can put something with a lot of you know, tensor indices at the beginning and can get a corresponding gadget at the end. And uh, we just don't know whether um, these things have curved analogs or not. Well, we know really, I mean, the answer is no, but nobody's proved it, right? Unfortunately. Other questions? Can I ask you a question? Hey, Mike. Can you Hi, hear me? Yeah. Hi, good. Um, a great talk. Thanks, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question about, um, so you have, um, you define the ambient metric in the conformal setting and you have an, also an ambient construction in the projective setting, I guess, Thomas Cohen. Um, yes. Is there such ambient constructions to proliferate to other geometries, potentially? Oh, I don't know. Um, Has that been looked at at all? Oh, I don't know. Probably other, I'm sure other people will know more about this than I do. Um, no, I mean, the only ones that I really know about are the uh, conformal case and the um, CR case and the uh, projective case. But the projective case is kind of, uh, kind of degenerate. I mean, there's a, there's a bundle over your projective manifold, but you're not going to thicken it in any way. You only add one more dimension. So CR, yeah, CR's no work. CR works in the same so But in the, uh, in the projective case, I mean, is the story similar as in you try to, you, you generate uh, projective invariance from uh, affine invariance of this connection on this bigger bundle? Is oh, that... yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Is there, is there is there any um, uh, obstructions, like funny business, like no, you know, even the no, 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 there's no, no, no funny business. 
Okay. okay, so so in the uh, projective case, I should say, yes, uh, Rod has written uh, quite a bit on this. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, this very, this very question of trying to find, oh, yeah, I should backtrack a little bit. So the very, very, this very question, for example, of trying to find even scalar conformal invariants on a general Riemannian manifold, right? But these are nonlinear expressions is, is a difficult one. And the original motivation for both the um, uh, conformal case and especially the CR case was to try and write down um, scalar, uh, CR invariants, scalar conformal invariants uh, by means of this construction. That was the entirely, that was in, you know, Charlie Fetterman's original motivation, especially in the CR case, mm. especially because in the CR case, as soon as you have his theorem about uh, you know, by holomorphisms of pseudo-convex domains extending to the boundary, you have you have to uh, you, you're you're drawn to the CR geometry on the boundary, and not only that, but the way he proves it is by means of the Bergman kernel. And the Bergman kernel has an asymptotic expansion, where the coefficients are necessarily CR invariants, but you don't know what they are. It's just so annoying. So <laughs> there's this standard standard. Uh, way of, of, of finding out what these things are by um, uh, finding out sort of in principle the form that they could possibly take because um, they must be invariant and then trying them on some examples. So um, yeah but um, and uh, oh yes and in the CR case the, this, the, the construction is um, always obstructed. It's always abstract. Oh, because you're, you're passing from CR, in CR case. odd dimension to uh, to one dimension more, so even dimensions. Yes, that's one way of seeing it. That's right. You could think of the CR dimension, CR case as being the conformal case in one dimension higher. Yeah, that's right. But just if you, if you just do it directly, which is what, what, uh, what's in uh, Fetterman's original article, just try and get directly and see it. You see that it's abstracted. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Yeah. This difference between, I should, one more thing, yeah, this difference between even dimensions and odd dimensions in conformal geometry you know, is all over the place. The classification of the operators, this, this pattern that I have on this last slide here, is applicable only in the even dimensional case. In the odd dimensional case, it's different and everything, is, uh, everything has curved analogs. The pattern of operator is different. The patterns of operators is different. And you can really trace all this back to you know the difference between you know, significant difference between the uh, you know, the vial groups of of, um, of the uh, uh, C series, uh, B series, and D series, and uh, and various other things like Huygens' principle and so on. You know the the difference. Yeah, you, know, you can really you can really get it. <laughs> all of these things are the same phenomena all over again. Yeah. So actually, just as an example with the, like, so if, if you were to go to, instead of four dimensions, five dimensions, uh, yeah. where do you have exceptional operators occurring? You still, oh, okay, so the, I, I, right, so I can't. So, so there's a Dural sequence. Yep. Okay. And then, so that's got, uh, what, six, six blobs in it. Okay. And the, um, in the odd dimensions, um, you don't, you don't have an operator um, you don't have any more operators in the Durham sequence or its siblings. Okay, you don't you simply don't. But however, uh, there are operators with half integral weights. Uh, the the other operators, like for example, the Laplacian, has a half integral weight. I mean, you can you can see that it's one minus n over two. So that also distinguishes between even dimensions and odd dimensions. So in the odd dimensional case, all of the other invariant operators have half integral weights. And they're just sort of completely separate from the Durham sequence. You have a you have a, a pattern which um, so I mean this this pattern here just breaks into two two pieces. One of them is the uh, where the uh, the weights are integral, and one of them is where the weights are half integral. Yeah. And, and you you get the Laplacian, the square Laplacian, uh, yeah, and, and and yeah, all of these things have curved analogs, and you can see it either by the ambient metric construction or simply by the fact that this translation principle, when you when you uh, when you get it working for the uh, for the tractor connection, it just doesn't it never breaks down. You can just go go and get them all from the tractor connection. Yeah, thanks. Lynn.
Yep. Okay. Cool. Any other?